This is purely a journalistic point of view. Nothing more has been said in this video other than that of which has been reported by various media sources and backed up with sources seen at the end of this video. You've probably heard that a lot of former wrestlers are suing WWE in a class action lawsuit based on concussions. Who are the players? What's the basis for their claims? And what does the lawsuit look like? This is a complicated case, so this video should be seen as an overview rather than a detailed summary. Join us now as Behind the Titantron examines the WWE concussion lawsuit. The lawsuit includes 53 wrestlers, some of whom worked for the company back when it was called the WWWF. Some of these individuals had short runs in the company, while others had longer stays. Since some of these wrestlers have passed away, the case may be in the wrestler's estate, waiting to be divided should the plaintiffs either prevail at trial or via settlement. The wrestlers are managed by the Kairos Law Firm, a six-person legal team headed up by Constantine Kairos. This is not the first time the Kairos Law Firm has represented wrestlers suing WWE. World Wrestling Entertainment has been named as a defendant. WWE responded to the lawsuit with a statement that read, quote, This is another ridiculous attempt by the same attorney who has previously filed class action lawsuits against WWE, both of which have been dismissed. A federal judge has already found this lawyer made patently false allegations about WWE, and this is more of the same. We're confident this lawsuit will suffer the same fate as his prior attempts and be dismissed. Kairos firm responded, quote, It has been the studied practice of WWE through its counsel to denigrate the motives and integrity of anyone who's courageous enough to protest WWE's self-serving choice to ignore the human toll and health crisis that its policies, fraud, and mistreatment of its workers have created. WrestleMania investigated the plaintiff's claims, relying on the Kairos law firm's blog concerning the lawsuit. The suit contains five main arguments why WWE should be held responsible for the concussions and CTE suffered by wrestlers. First, the plaintiffs argue there's a history of medical neglect and indifference by WWE. Second, plaintiffs refer to the long and grueling schedule they worked where there is no off-season and few days to rest. Third, the plaintiffs argue said medical neglect and dangerous work schedule led to injuries, drug addiction, and even death for wrestlers. Fourth, plaintiffs point out that long-term head injuries take a toll. Fifth, the plaintiffs argue WWE knew about the CTE crisis and did not take any steps to deal with it until 2007. Furthermore, they argue WWE has not helped retired wrestlers who may have concussions and or CTE. Central to this lawsuit is the idea the company intentionally mislabeled wrestlers as independent contractors rather than employers so they could shift liability for injuries. Part of the plaintiffs complaint alleges, quote, WWE controls plaintiffs' personal lives just as strictly as their professional careers, that WWE regulated what the plaintiffs could wear in public, how they traveled, where they trained, how they trained, where, when, and how they performed, and what medical treatment they received, if any. This Kairos website blog contains two important statements regarding the foundation of the lawsuit. The first is the argument that WWE's policies and practices exploited wrestlers. Quote, An extensive investigation into the policies and practices of WWE has revealed a systematic exploitative business practice which uses unconscionable booking contracts to deceive the wrestlers about their legal rights, which deprive them of the legal protections that are given to U.S. workers under federal labor and employment laws. Without these protections which were enacted to protect workers' health and safety, the wrestlers after retirement are now in a health crisis, with many disabled because of their wrestling careers. Also note that the wrestlers are, per the plaintiff's allegations, misclassified as independent contractors, deprived of statutory rights and OSHA regulation, further eroding a defense by WWE as compared to other contact sports in which there is an employment relationship, unionization, regulation, and public oversight of the activities that may result in injury. A quick review of the plaintiff's factual allegations in the complaint reveals where they are now, broken in body and mind, many now disabled, graphically showing the outcome of the unregulated regime that WWE has maintained over these athlete. The second argument concerns the head injuries suffered by wrestlers. Quote, the plaintiffs allege head injuries in two forms. One, open and obvious concussions that WWE failed to adequately treat and diagnose, as well as two, long-term effects and risks of repeated head trauma that can cause an occupational disease like CTE that a wrestler would not know about unless educated by a doctor or WWE. Thus, the wrestling match in ring activity itself, the routine, ordinary bumps and maneuvers, as well as the so-called accidental incidents that often result in concussions, cause latent, unseen, and long-term 
harm that results in damages to the plaintiff. That physical activity itself, which during its routine performance is causing unseen harm for which there is a duty to warn, the same is true in other contact sports, such as the NFL and NHL, in which routine head trauma also appears to result in CTE and latent occupational neurological disease. There is also the plaintiff's claim that WWE assumed liability for ECW and WCW when it acquired the companies in 2001. As we discussed in the Behind the Titantron episode on the WCW racism lawsuit, a company normally does not acquire another company's liabilities when it purchases it. However, plaintiffs argue WWE accepted the liabilities because it met the conditions that, quote, the transaction may be viewed as a de facto merger or consolidation, and the successor is the mere continuation of the predecessor, end quote. Given the firm that pursued the WCW case to a successful settlement, did not pursue WWE for damages concerning WCW, it can be argued Kairos' case is weak here. WWE is making a number of defenses concerning the lawsuit. One, there was an assumption of risk by the wrestlers, i.e. they knew the job involved the worked environment, but there were still assumed risks of injury. A second is, WWE superstars are independent contractors instead of employees, and are responsible for their own medical care. A third defense is that 19 of the individuals named in the lawsuit waived their right to sue in the company when they signed earlier agreements. This includes stars such as Bill Eady, who WWE claims signed an agreement concerning his use of the Demolition Axe character, which also saw him sign away his right to sue concerning concerning anything related to his WWE career. Another example is Mark Canterbury, aka Henry Godwin, who signed on the 15th of June of this year from any and all personal injury claims, now known or later discovered, arising out of or related to his past affiliation with or performances rendered to WWE. Keep in mind in some cases, a plaintiff cannot sign away rights to pursue a lawsuit, but that is something the court will have to determine. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy was named by Dr. Bennett Amalu, a physician, forensic pathologist, and neuropathologist. Dr. Amalu noticed abnormalities in the brains of football players after conducting autopsies on them, which led to further exploration of the brain damage caused by repeated blows to the head. Dr. Amalu called this condition chronic traumatic encephalopathy and warned the NFL about it. The NFL's response was slow, but a lawsuit settlement in August of 2013 suggests the NFL realized the dangers of CTE or the dangers of CTE litigation. The role of concussions in affecting people's long-term health has been brought to the public's attention, largely due to the NFL's legal settlement with former players who claimed concussions impacted their health and the NFL did not take the proper steps to protect them. The effects of even a mild concussion can be powerful. According to the U.S. National Institute of Health, a study found comparing 50 concussion patients with the same number of healthy people, researchers found that the brains of those suffering concussions showed abnormalities four months later. This happened despite the fact that their symptoms had already eased to some degree. In some cases, people who are concussed suffer from post-concussion symptoms. Syndrome. The treatment for post-concussion syndrome is rest and avoiding stress. Since professional wrestlers often work hurt, it's easy to see how a concussed wrestler may suffer for a long time. Given the proliferation of unprotected chair shots and other impactful moves that can go wrong, some suggest there is evidence to support the dangerous work environment of wrestlers. However, according to a 2016 article, scientists have not linked CTE with the activities performed by professional wrestlers, unlike research connecting CTE with NFL players. What do active and retired wrestlers think of the lawsuit? There are a number of opinions, but each of them summarize the perceived merit, or lack thereof, concerning the claims. Jumping Jim Brunzel of the Killer Bees is a plaintiff in the case, and recalls having to work a match the night after he was accidentally knocked out in the ring. Brunzel said in a 2016 interview, quote, So I can't remember who the agent was who said, he has to work tonight because we had no substitute. We went over and I was working with Hercules, Ray Fernandez, and the doctor told him, the only way that I'll let Jim wrestle tonight is if you don't hit him in the head, slam him, or in any way kick him in the head. We agreed and had a pretty decent match, and he got disqualified. But the reason why I did that was because there was no thought in head injuries during that early time of the WWE. And what this lawsuit is trying to get is money from WWE to put in a pool to compensate for these guys that might have early dementia. It's the same lawsuit that got the $4 billion in the NFL." End quote. 25-year veteran Lance Storm is against the lawsuit. In a 2016 interview with the Calgary Eye Opener, Storm noted, quote, At the end of the day, pro wrestling is designed to be a non-contact sport in a way. It's not a true competitive sport. It's a performance art, and when you do the job properly, you don't actually hit people very hard, end quote. Storm claims he was never diagnosed with a concussion, but he is working with the Concussion Legacy Foundation, participating in an annual evaluation to help study the impact of concussions. Storm has also made plans to donate his brain and brainstem to the foundation. Storm believes drugs and alcohol may 
may play a role in CTE. Quote, there's a lot of drugs and alcohol involved in sport, and we don't know what role that plays in addition to concussions. They've got football players, they've got basketball players, they've got wrestlers. I was someone that never drank and never did drugs of any kind. So when they're doing this study, if my results are different than other athletes that suffer the similar physical symptoms, then perhaps the results could be compounded or do more to the drugs and alcohol and lifestyle professional athletes. End quote. Wrestler Dan Spivey has his own thoughts on the lifestyle of WWF superstars during the 1980s. Quote, I got into wrestling because I loved it. I wanted more than anything to be a WWF superstar. Did I get injured? Yes. Six hip replacements, neck fusion, knee replacement, plus a few other minor injuries, but I was never forced to work hurt and these never stopped me from living my dream. Did I work seven days a week? Yes, because in the 80s, that's what you did to be the best at what you loved. Because of the WWF, I traveled the world, I became a household name, and loved it. Did I have an addiction to drugs and alcohol? Yes, but not because of wrestling, but because of me. I can tell you six years later, I am clean and sober because of the WWE. The WWE has a program in place where former superstars can go to a rehab facility, all expenses paid, no questions asked, which I was able to take advantage of. The WWE has had this program in place since 2007, end quote. One of the most interesting aspects of the case is Chris Nowinski's Concussion Legacy Foundation, a nonprofit organization which studies CTE. Some believe WWE will rely on Nowinski's foundation to support their defense. A possible problem is WWE has pledged $2.7 million to the foundation, and that Triple H is a member of the board of directors. In a 2016 interview, Mark Pollock of the Giving Back Fund, a nonprofit which manages charities for athletes, entertainers, and corporations, commented, quote, It certainly seems like a situation where you're asking the Foxes to help guard the chicken coop. If you're part with a company that's facing those kinds of concussion lawsuits, where's the firewall? End quote. WWE attorney Jerry McDevitt was quoted in a 2016 article saying, we don't in any way try to control their affairs. The case is currently in settlement negotiations after the judge ordered both parties to settle the case. The Kairos law firm stated on a blog entry dated August 30th, 2017, the kind of relief the wrestlers want. Ideas for resolving the case include, one, full health insurance coverage for all plaintiffs and their families who don't have it or can't afford it. Two, lump sum disability and or disability payouts based on medical diagnosis, in part based on total number of WWE, WCW, and WCW matches offset by social security disability income or supplemental security income. Three, WWE should pay for medical monitoring for CTE for all plaintiffs. Four, additional payouts for diagnosed neurological conditions for plaintiffs with qualifying diagnoses. Five, WWE should pay for a comprehensive study focusing on the death rate in wrestling with a view to help them lower it. Six, a program to build and improve outreach to wrestlers in need. Seven, fair royalty payments and a full accounting to all plaintiffs. Eight, WWE should correctly classify wrestlers as employees. Nine, WWE should finance wrestler-specific CTE research. And 10, WWE should give lump sum payments to plaintiffs with CTE diagnoses after death. WWE has denied a link between CTE and wrestlers, so would they settle? With the case in the settlement phase, there's the possibility WWE might concede and make a payment rather than taking the case to trial and risking an even larger judgment should the plaintiffs prevail. However, given Vincent Mann's refusal to give in during a steroid trial and his hard-fought battle against WCW, it seems unlikely McMahon would give in, even if presented with strong evidence that the company would lose. It should be noted, WWE is a publicly traded company, and McMahon could have more pressure from stockholders considering whether or not to take a settlement in lieu of trial. The lawsuit does raise important issues about wrestlers' safety and the shadowy border wrestlers walk between being independent contractors and employees. WWE has taken steps to deal with concussion issues, substance abuse issues, and the use of performance-enhancing drugs. While it can be argued these are self-serving and not flawless, it can also be argued WWE deserves credit for this, particularly its open invitation for any former employee to accept substance abuse rehabilitation treatment. Given the NFL's recent concussion lawsuit settlement, it's difficult to believe WWE's lawsuit will go away without a settlement or being forced into trial. Either way, it could cost WWE a considerable amount of money, particularly if the company has no insurance to mitigate the cost of a settlement. Well guys, that was episode 27 of Behind the Titan Tron. I sincerely hope you enjoyed it, but before I close off the video, I just wanted to give a massive thanks to Brian Zane who narrated the episode and to tell you all to go check out his channel as he's got some phenomenal content. I also wanted to thank every single one of you now 105,000 subscribers. Honestly, it goes without saying that none of this would be possible without every single one of you. So with that said, I'll see you next time with some more wrestling content.